31st. Dive in and discover what the Exploratorium is all about with 600 exhibits indoors and out, including new features and beloved classics. Admission is free on January 31st and February 1st to KQED members who show their current KQED member card. Visit kqed.org slash member day for more information. It was a showpiece from the moment it was built. Chateau Carolands. With 98 rooms and 65,000 square feet, it was the dream home of one of the wealthiest women in America. But more than once, it was abandoned and destined for demolition. Hillsborough, I think, did not want to save it. Go inside this Bay Area mansion to witness its return to its original glory on the heiress and her chateau, tonight at 7. From the golden age of opulence stands Britain's most famous country home. Despite an ancient curse, these houses give up secrets in strange places. And the threat of war and ruin, you don't want to be the earl that puts the whole thing down. It became the real life star of Downton Abbey. It never fluffs its lines, does it? And it always looks great. The Secrets of Highclere Castle. Tonight at 8 on KQED. On Masterpiece. I blushed to admit it, but I was very drunk. So you're not going to deny it? If I behave badly, I am sorry. I'm sorry to keep you waiting, but Anna couldn't find one. Ah, I hope I'm a surprise and not a shock. I thought I could take you all to hear the new band at the Lotus Club. Rose McClare, how do you do? You're trusting this man with your name and your reputation. Michael. Oh, my darling. We live together, we work together. Sometimes I think he's just too much. Downton Abbey on Masterpiece. Tonight at 9 on KQED. Experience San Francisco Ballet in Giselle, a romantic ballet that has thrilled audiences for generations. Giselle, a classic tale of love, deceit, and the supernatural. January 25th through February 2nd. Learn more at sfballet.org. This program made possible by Stephen Silver Fine Jewelry, a global jewelry company based in the heart of Silicon Valley, strategically advising families and individuals in the procurement and sale of precious gemstones, estate, and fine jewelry for over four decades. And by Fiduciary Trust Company International, for more than 80 years, helping families grow and preserve their assets for generations to come. And Wells Fargo Bank. Together, we'll go far. And ISU Insurance Services, the one responsible source for all your insurance needs. Our knowledge is your best insurance. A view moves over a long, rectangular pool set in a manicured lawn toward a three-story mansion topped with a dome and a mansard roof. It was a showpiece from the moment that they built it. It was the largest private home west of the Mississippi. I believe there's 1.3 million cubic feet of space in this house. Columns back a grand stairway. It's not the most practical thing to have a house that has over 90 rooms. This building is a window to a whole other period in American history. A house is a kind of three-dimensional history. It's been sold and bought and 
given back again. Some people say that there is a curse on this house. It's often said that there was a murder in this house. All kinds of outrageous claims about this building. Haunted mansion up in Hillsboro. Anybody with any children would say, my God, our kids go up there all the time. Let's face it, Carolands was a community eyesore for many years. It looked like the wart on the end of somebody's nose. A house of this size attracts envy. I think it was built to attract envy. Photos capture barbed wire fences and boarded up windows. Money should show itself in truly grand architecture like this. Books fill shelves in a two-story library with oak paneling. If ever there was an American Downton Abbey, this is it. Chateau Carolans. A 98-room mansion with a 98-year history. An architectural masterpiece dreamed by an heiress. Where a man might leave his mark in politics or industry, the heiress made her legacy her home. Pouring her fortune into a chateau of extraordinary beauty. So graceful. So grand. Attracting both wealth and ruin. The pool reflects the chateau's stucco exterior. A title, The Heiress and Her Chateau, Carolines of California. Now a black and white photo of the chateau in a sparse field. 20 miles south of San Francisco, in Hillsboro, California, stands Chateau Carolines. Nearly a hundred years ago, when it was built, it was the second largest home in the United States. 65,000 square feet, 98 rooms, bigger than the White House. Previous owner, Ann Johnson. The only trouble is when I can't find where I put my coffee cup, Dan. It can be a big project. On a third story balcony overlooking the atrium. Well, first when we moved in, I could never find my husband. I didn't know where he was. The problem is now I'm using all 98 rooms. They're used to having a place for everything. Books. They go in the two-story oak-paneled library. Dinner parties in the dining room. With a long table and 20 chairs. Guests in any one of the 17 guest rooms. In fact, the guests say, well, I'm not going to leave. And then there is the blue salon, the Bordeaux salon, the Chinese lacquer room, the ballroom, the solarium. And there's a whole room just for linens, a room just for flower arranging, a room just for wrapping gifts, for vegetables, for Christmas trees. Round rooms, square rooms, big rooms, small rooms, secret passageways, and giant open spaces. Columns line the atrium. I admired the architecture of this house, and I thought the woman who had built it must have been a very, very smart, stylish woman who had good taste. The woman who built a home so big, so refined, so expensive, was Harriet Pullman Carolan, heiress to the Pullman railroad car fortune. Steam trains speed along railroad tracks. Harriet Pullman was born in 1869, the same year that the Transcontinental Railroad was completed. Men lay rail over sleepers and pound in stakes. Surrounded by workers, two men shake hands. Through these railway lines, American industry will explode with growth, building the great fortunes of the age. Before this, businessmen of the previous generation competed for hundreds of dollars. Now, they will amass millions. Andrew Carnegie, John D. Rockefeller, Henry Ford, and George Pullman, Harriet Pullman's father. Warren Pullman Miller. George Pullman was my great-grandfather. Pullman started out poor. In a relatively short period of time, he was one of the wealthiest people in Chicago, if not in the United States. Before George Pullman, traveling and sleeping on trains was a misery. The Pullman Palace Railway car changed that by bringing comfort and quality 
to the everyday necessity of railway travel. Plush lounge seating fills a car. And for a while, the Pullman name was synonymous with luxury. A chandelier hangs from the ceiling and velvet drapes line the windows. Paul Price, Carol Ann's historian. George Pullman was well known as a 19th century American industrialist whose standards were basically impossibly high. And that is what made for him a lot of his success. In a photo, the goateed Pullman reclines in a chair. Harriet seems like her father. The ingrained high standards seems as natural to Harriet as breathing air. She expected perfection and beauty in anything she touched, ate, wore, or lived in. And so her taste was extraordinarily, uniquely refined. Harriet wears an elegant gown in a room full of gold-framed paintings. Harriet's taste was specifically dictated by her great love of things French. In a photo, she wears a fleur-de-lis hairpin. Harriet Pullman, coming from Chicago, which had to be one of the dirtiest cities in America. Historian Michael Svanovic. And smelliest cities in America. She appreciated the culture of Europe. She came to be almost hypnotized by all things French. But when it came time to marry, she chose an American. She wears a wedding dress, historian Gray Brechen. Harriet Pullman could have easily had a prince or a, a count or a baron, whatever she wanted at that time. There were marriage brokers in Europe to organize that kind of thing, and her wealth would have entitled her to buying a title. She didn't. So it probably was initially a marriage of love. Handsome, athletic, friendly. His name was Francis Carolan. Frank to his friends. He was, in a word, popular, something Harriet was not. A photo of a mustached Francis playing polo. He was warm. He was a good storyteller. He played polo. He looked magnificent. He was the ultimate sportsman. Newspaper headlines, love and beauty, marriage of Miss Harriet Pullman to Mr. Carolyn, a magnificent scene, and a brilliant wedding, Pullman Carolyn nuptials celebrated. Loaded with gifts, the newly married couple left Harriet's home in Chicago for California. Their destination? The San Francisco Peninsula. Architect Bobby Sue Hood. San Francisco was a very rich city. In the gold rush, it was established as a city that had money. And so in a city which has money, you have people who have money, and they want to live well. Names appear under mansions. Charles Templeton Crocker, Darius Ogden Mills. So early on, the whole peninsula was the province of the wealthy, and people competed on the size of their houses, the size of the attendant land, and on the height of the hills on which they were located. A.P. Giannini, Walter Hobart. The San Francisco Peninsula blossomed with the building of great houses. Elvin Hayward. It was a period of historical or maybe I should say architectural one-upmanship. In a photo, mourners load a casket into a hearse drawn by two white horses. But unexpectedly, in Chicago, Harriet's father, George Pullman, died in 1897. A headline, Where Pullman Millions Go, Mrs. Frank Carolyn's Large Share of the Property. With her inheritance, Harriet Pullman Carolyn became one of the wealthiest women in America. If she wanted to compete and build a grand house, there was potentially no limit to what she could do. Throngs of people stream through Union Square as American flags flutter. A sketch portrait of Harriet and Francis. Harriet and Frank moved in, joined in, and fit in to the San Francisco Peninsula's elite social scene. Here, through party after party, Harriet sent the message that she intended to reign supreme. There's a good deal of social rivalry going on. You have Harriet coming in, and I think that she was a great snob and a social climber. Now, the Crockers were considered the real leaders of society in San Francisco and Hillsborough, and Harriet wanted a way to put Ethel Crocker in her place. How do you do that? Well, of course, you spend more money. For example, this fancy dress ball of Harriet's cost $90,000 in today's money. 
A headline, one of the most brilliant functions given in California. The spending worked. When President Teddy Roosevelt came to Burlingame in May 1903, it was the Carolans who picked him up at the train station in a horse carriage purchased just for this event. These were the happiest years for the couple. But that would change. Photos capture devastated buildings and piles of rubble. Headlines, earthquake and fire, San Francisco in ruins. And 300,000 are homeless, hungry, and helpless. Within hours of the earthquake, refugees were flooding south down the San Francisco Peninsula toward the grand homes of Burlingame, which threatened the privacy of the wealthy San Francisco elite who lived there. So a whole group of people seceded from Burlingame. They formed something called Hillsboro. Hillsboro. Hillsboro, which was really the creme de la creme. Frank Carolyn poses with Hobart and Spreckles. And they could then run the city and have control over it and also exclude undesirable people. There might not ever again be a town quite like Hillsboro. Two historians in 1916 called it a municipality of millionaires, richer per capita than any other city in the world. The millionaires wrote their city charter to protect their luxurious exclusive property by allowing one and only one thing to be built in Hillsboro, private family homes. No businesses, no hotels, no gas stations, no pay phones, no jail, no churches, and by law, not even sidewalks were allowed. One local newspaper called it a perfumed city. In photos, people dance and ride horses. Thus were the seeds for Chateau Carolans sown. Among the grand homes of Hillsboro, Harriet Pullman Carolan decided to build the grandest of them all. A photo shows Harriet in a jewel-adorned gown, fur coat, and pearl necklace. Harriet was 43. A lifetime of wealth and fine taste had prepared her for this moment like no other woman alive. Grainy footage captures the Seine River. And so in 1912, in Paris, she found the architect who would make her dreams come true. Ernest Sanson, the most renowned architect of private homes in France and perhaps in the world. Sanson was near the end of his brilliant career. Carolans would be one of the last and greatest of his buildings. Blueprints appear. Sanson was trained at a school in Paris called the Beaux-Arts. The Beaux-Arts was the place to train architects. In Architect Patrick McGrew. Well, this style actually uh, in, in common vernacular is called Beaux-Arts, but the Beaux-Arts was actually a school, not a style. And what the school taught was to look at examples of historic architecture and find a kind of resonance that fit a particular project. The historic resonance Sanson found was in the architecture of Louis XIV, king and absolute monarch of 17th century France. Louis built the Palace of Versailles to display his overwhelming wealth and power. A painting depicts the king surveying the construction. Just as Louis ruled France from his chateau at Versailles, Harriet intended to rule over California society from her chateau in Hillsborough. Thus, the oversized grand scale of Carolans is, by design, a statement about wealth and power. A sketch of Carolans' looming north facade slowly fades to a photograph. The 98 rooms include four kitchens, 17 guest rooms, 17 fireplaces, 18 bathrooms. The central court, with its grand stairway and rising columns, is the largest interior space of any private home in the United States. Sunlight pours through a skylight above the split grand staircase. Columns line balconies above. But Sanson's real achievement is to combine grandeur with warmth. The warmth of the color of the walls. The warm light of the gigantic skylight 103 feet above the ground. 
the warm feeling from the graceful colonnades that make one feel invited and protected. Ornate wrought iron railings stretch between Romanesque columns bathed in a yellow glow. The other characteristic of Beaux-Arts buildings is devoting a lot of space and a lot of grandeur just to circulation. Carolans devotes an extraordinary 70% of its space to public space, to enter and move about, to gather and socialize, to see and be seen. At an event, people mill about with drinks and hors d'oeuvres. And so, just as Harriet intended, Carolans is an architectural invitation to enjoy the grandest social life imaginable. In a black and white photo, Harriet poses in front of a suit of armor. Harriet prepared for her new grandest of homes in the classic way. She went shopping. Photos of antique chairs, couches, davenports, benches, vases, dressers, divans, and pitchers. She went off to Europe on great buying expeditions, thinking about building this house. She was determined that it should be authentically decorated and went to France and went into palaces and castles and great houses and bought entire rooms. This room, an 18th century masterpiece of interior design, was purchased by Harriet in its entirety. Floor, wall panels, and ceiling. In the Bordeaux Salon. This photograph actually shows the room in place in France, in Bordeaux, in the house from which it was removed. The same fireplace, chandelier, paneling, flooring, and sconces adorn the Caroline's Bordeaux Salon. The room was a star in Bordeaux, in the house in which it sat for over a hundred years intricately carved wall panels and molding. The carvings on the walls with the festoons of the spring flowers all integrate with the carvings above, celebrating springtime and plenty. There's even the wedding crowns above with the flowers, the eggs broken with the birds creating nests in them. And we have as a central feature of the ceiling the beautiful carving of Apollo, the god of the sun. Above the chandelier, it's so refined that it takes you to a point where it can't get more beautiful. Alternating lengths of dark and light hardwood create a sunburst pattern on the floor. Now, holes and piles of dirt on the estate grounds. June 1st, 1914. Excavation of the site begins. But before much progress is made... Cannons fire. A soldier tumbles into a trench and ranks march. World War I begins. Despite wartime shortages, Harriet plunges ahead. She begins to pour her fortune into the construction of her dream home, starting with the truly vast excavation of the building site. Horses haul carts of dirt. Her mother wrote, I'm afraid that you will get yourself in trouble. With your ideas, you will have such a costly house to pay for and maintain that you may not have much left after it is finished. Photos capture the chateau's wooden frame and concrete columns. These photos of the construction process revealed the hidden structure of the building. Poured in place concrete columns and floors, followed by exterior walls in stucco made to look like stone. A photo of the frame transitions to the clad chateau. Construction difficulties were many. Hundreds of construction workers were drawn away to San Francisco to build the colossal structures for the Panama Pacific International Exposition of 1915. An outline of the proposed construction. This historic event, with one million people expected to attend, was of the utmost importance for Harriet and all the California elite. It was probably California's all-time greatest high society event. Royalty was expected to come, and Harriet Carolan was determined that she would have a house that was worthy of entertaining these people. So Harriet decided to spare no expense finishing her chateau, spending not only her own fortune, but getting one million dollars of her mother's money as well. The hardware for the windows and doors, designed and cast in France, gilded with 18 karat gold. In the dining room, Champagne fountains in the corners, 
and marbleized hardwood decorating the walls. Cornices and moldings, custom made under the direction of a Frenchman, brought over for that specific purpose. And this, a Chinese room with antique black lacquer paneling, Harriet's foray into Orientalism, the latest artistic craze which was sweeping Europe at the turn of the century. Harriet's bathroom, with a tub carved out of a single large piece of white marble, and a secret staircase so that a maid could appear just when needed. Murals, paintings, ironwork, inlay, sculpture, chandeliers, wood carvings, stone carvings. And for 1915, the house included the most modern of conveniences, a call bell system to summon servants at the push of a button. An elevator, complete with skylight, hand-carved wood details, and couch. And that most up-to-date technology of the time, electricity. The clock tower atop the San Francisco Ferry Building reads, 1915. Carol Ann's construction is over budget and behind schedule. And so the great push went ahead to completing this house. Builders work on the skeletal frame and lay flooring. And of course, World War I was on. Uh, there was a delay of getting materials from Europe. There was a delay of getting the furnishings. The Panama Pacific International Exposition shines with dazzling lights. And Harriet Carolyn's dream of participating in the Panama Pacific International Exposition became one of her great disappointments. There were no great parties. There were no great visitors here during the exposition. In a photo, Harriet frowns under a wide-brimmed hat. The house was not finished when she thought it would be, and she and her husband, Frank, actually occupied sort of the servants' quarters when it was first opened because she was so anxious to get in here. Near the end, she actually hired her husband to oversee the finishing of the project. She accused Frank of not being firm enough, not supervising properly. At some point, she took over herself. Things only got worse. She poured everything that she had into it. And that probably led to the estrangement of husband and wife. I think that the house is what finished their marriage. A photo of Francis appears beside the Carolan Chateau, then fades. And in truth, the house never was completed. Harriet had one and only one grand party in the house. A formal dinner for 16, followed by a reception in honor of her and Frank's 25th wedding anniversary. It was the last party she and Frank hosted together. Harriet's photo appears by the chateau. She stares straight ahead as the mansion fades behind her. It must have been heartbreaking. She overreached, not out of money, but her income was compromised. Even the Pullman fortune had its limits. Harriet's mother writes, to build such a house as you are doing, I felt from the first that you were making yourself no end of money trouble. It has always worried me to have you spend such enormous sums. I think your plan to close the house is a wise one. For Harriet to have gone through all of this to get this house built, it must have been a really bitter pill. Although Frank and Harriet never divorced, they separated in 1917. He remained in California until his death in 1923. In 1925, Harriet went east to New York and remarried. In a photo, she sits beside her second husband. What remained was the house itself, waiting for the next person with enough imagination and money to conceive of putting 98 rooms to good use. A view drifts away from the chateau over the estate's expansive grounds. 
it would stand empty for 29 years. Fade to black. May 8, 1945, in the streets, crowds celebrate waving newspapers. Throughout the world, throngs of people hail the end of the war in Europe. The end of World War II for most Americans ushered in a period of optimism and economic boom. People who had always dreamed of owning a home now could. And across the country, housing developments sprang up. Harriet's Chateau was not considered of value, but the land it stood on was. 550 acres was a fortune waiting to be made. Robin Mosley O'Connell. My dad bought the Carolines and the surrounding 550 acres. My mother was not as excited about having to clean 98 rooms. A photo of Tomlinson Mosley in a newspaper. My dad was an inventor. He invented the first electric toothbrush, first electric shaver, a phonograph needle for RCA Victor, the scanner scope for radar, the Bariant winch, a reeling wave, which was a cold wave permanent. That's how he met my mother. She owned a beauty shop. He was an amazing little man. We were a happy family while we were here. When Robin entered the front door on this day, it had been over 50 years since she'd lived here. Robin slowly walks in the front door. She steps to the bottom of the split grand staircase and gazes up at the columns and skylight above. Her jaw drops. <laughs> she smiles and wipes away a tear as she heads upstairs. It is so beautiful. She pauses on the landing by a niche housing a classical marble bust. I don't think I've ever loved a house so much. Robin continues on to the second level, then stops to wipe tears from her eyes. <sighs> there are so many memories that I just, it's very difficult. A photo of Robin as a young girl. It's, it's, it's like it's moments ago. Robin leans against the second story railing, gazing up toward the skylight. A massive tapestry depicting a forest scene hangs on the wall beside her. The chateau's blueprints appear. The Mosley family only lived here for two years. But their stay was remarkable for the night of February 1st, 1947, when the house at long last fulfilled its intended purpose as a magnificent place for a party. This is the ballroom. And the only party that my parents really ever had was when my mother opened the house to Life magazine. Headlines, life goes to a party in a deserted mansion. It was a benefit gala for the Stanford Convalescent Home. After 25 years, a Pullman heiress's abandoned French chateau is opened up by San Francisco socialites. Over 1,500 swarmed in, drawn to see inside the Carolan's mystery castle, open for the first time in nearly 30 years. Partygoers crowd the grand stairway and second-story balcony. <laughs> it, was, it was wonderful. And my brother and I hid up <laughs> A nook. Peek ...to see what was going on. Many, many people crowded into Harriet's bathtub, and Life magazine showed people leaving their plates on the staircase, and I think the plates on the staircase would have absolutely driven Harriet mad. And in my heart of hearts, I hope she never saw the magazine. Now dark clouds hang over the chateau. But aside from that one party, few people saw the chateau as anything of value. Headlines, chateau to be raised, builder buys Caroline's estate on Peninsula, and famed mansion to be torn down. It seemed the end was at hand for Caroline's. Caroline's $3 million chateau overlooking San Mateo will soon be history. A state is to be subdivided. In 1950, with the house about to face the wrecking ball, Countess Lillian Remillard Dandini said, I never dreamed of having the house, but when I heard it was going to be torn down, I bought it. I may have saved the finest residence in the world today. A photo of the Countess fades over an aerial view of the chateau. Jennifer Bruhard, niece of Countess Dandini, we heard that she bought this estate. 
And I remember do, do, getting into our old 1950 Dodge and driving up here and getting out in front of the chateau. <laughs> a photo of her at age five. I grew up here. She plays on a patio. I called her Lillian. <laughs> My Aunt Lillian. Other people called her Countess. In a photo, Countess Dandini poses on stairs. When she bought the chateau, the Countess was 70 years old. Her money, originally, came from her father, Peter Remillard, and the Remillard Brick Company. Remillard Bricks had built the city of San Francisco, twice. Once after the gold rush, and a second time after the great earthquake and fire of 1906. Bricks are not very glamorous, but fortunately for her, her father had built up a considerable fortune, and with that fortune, she was able to buy the title of Countess. There's the Countess getting married, and my mother here is on her right. In a photo, Countess Dandini holds a bouquet flanked by two bridesmaids. The Countess was 52 years old when she married in 1932. And her handsome husband, Count Alessandro Dandini, was more than 20 years her junior. He wears a suit adorned with medallions. We always called it sort of a marriage of convenience. The Count probably liked the idea of having some finances, but she was very smitten with him. The newlyweds pose arm in arm. That was her only marriage. Alessandro Dandini, a Mexican-born Italian count. He was a, um, a man who loved women uh, and was never particularly faithful. We've heard that he was sort of a count of no account. <laughs> Cecilia Damia and Donna Pribble. Who had little to offer but his title. Upon their marriage, Lillian made the count a co-owner of her brick company. But within four years, according to Lillian, he embezzled $50,000 and was keeping company with other women. In 1942, he pled guilty to non-payment of income taxes and went to federal prison for 18 months. He poses with a black sombrero. After his release, he filed for divorce. And so, although the marriage was not successful, she had enough money and the title that she thought when she saw this house that in fact, this was the proper place for her to be. Socialites mill about in the chateau. And so began an era of social life in the chateau a time of music and parties. Neighbor Janice Rossi. This place was exciting the minute that you walked in. The star of the show, to my way of thinking, was the entry, the marbled floored entry with that split staircase. It practically demanded that you wear your best. Lillian was the original party girl. I know I personally attended one of her many parties. Of course, her little musicals were, were lovely. She had so many opera singers that would come. For her 85th birthday, the guest of honor, um, besides herself, was the evangelist Billy Graham. She, at the drop of a hat, would say, sure, Woodside Fashion Club, come up. Models strut an outdoor catwalk. Furs for fall and winter, on display in a swanky setting in Hillsborough, California. Mainly, it's a mink affair, all for sweet charity to aid crippled children. And Top California Society turns out to see the latest in fine furs displayed at the fabulous chateau of Countess Lillian Remillard Dandini. A gracious hostess receives an orchid corsage as thanks for opening her home and heart to charity. The Countess smiles and fastens the corsage to her blouse in a crowded pavilion. Newspaper photos flash by as the Countess ages. The Countess spent 23 years in the Chateau, entertaining and being entertained. But by the last years of her life, the Countess was running short of money. She lived modestly in the Chateau, in just a few rooms on the upper floors, not having the money or the staff to prevent an overall decline in the conditions for the building. Light shine in three windows of the otherwise dark chateau. She loved this house and pre-planned her funeral in it precisely. 
An obituary, Countess Lillian Dandini Wright sat at her mansion. Countess Dandini died at age 93 in 1973. And at that time, she insisted that the funeral be in this house and that she be laid out and stayed in this, actually this very room. Um, that uh, and invited all the people of Hillsborough to climb the grand stairway and come in and uh, view her remains. Wearing a loose-fitting blue gown, she smiles to the camera with her head cocked to the side. She lay in an open casket, wearing a diamond tiara. Like a queen lying in state, the countess welcomed her public to visit her in her chateau one last time. Headlines, Dandini Will admitted to probate, library proposals for chateau due, and Hillsborough can't afford chateau. Lillian willed the chateau to Hillsborough for a library of books, art, and music, but provided no money for the books, or the art, or the building. And of course there were the demolition group. Uh, that thing is the wart on the end of somebody's nose. Let's demolish it. And they were pretty strong. Dorothy Wexler, neighbor for 30 years. We did not like it. The building was in such disarray, it was unbelievable. We looked at it, and I thought to myself, this is a big building that's useless. Just a pile of concrete. And there were tour buses that came around. What are they looking at? Couldn't understand. We wanted it gone. Photos capture wall panels with peeling paint, bricks crumbling from a fireplace, boards covering broken windows, and doors lying off their hinges. Hillsborough, I think, did not want to save it. Nobody really wanted it. And so it gradually falls into ruin. Sheathing on the dome deteriorates. The house looked more and more odd, surrounded by ranch-style houses. A modest one-story next door. And the neighbors came to resent it. It had been just so totally, totally forgotten. A no trespassing sign hangs in front of the decaying chateau. Inside, paint peels on the walls. Broken glass letters a windowsill. Faded wallpaper curls at its edges. All I could think of was, what a shame. What a shame. In the early 1980s, a movie company somehow managed to gain access. Women in short skirts and high heels exit a car and head up the grand stairway. Oh my God. <laughs> Actually, the house played the part of a great baronial home in England where the girls got together to tell their raunchiest sexual tale. In the dining room. I like to make a toast. One of my students was a Hillsborough police officer. And he came to me one day after I had spoken of Frank and Harriet Carolyn and this house and said, have you seen the pornographic film? And I said, no. And he said, would you like to see it? We have a copy in the police locker. And um, I had an opportunity to study it. A red-haired woman runs a hand along her chest, then peels off her shirt. It was always a dramatic place. Something was always occurring. Headlines, attack at the Carolines ends in slaying of San Mateo teen. And then the tragedy, the security guard episode. Another teen is stabbed, guard is under arrest. Mansion is setting of ruthless stabbing crime. Children came and went here, you know. So it wasn't unusual that two teenage girls would be curious. Survivor recalls day of terror at mansion. There was a caretaker, and he lured some schoolgirls into the house by the offer to see the house. And of course, everybody wanted to see the house. Ruthless ordeal for two local students. There was an assault. Slaying girl mourned in Burlingame. It's often said that there was a murder in this house. There never was a murder in this house because the girls were quite alive. He put them in his car, his intention to get rid of them. The caretaker dumped their bodies in a ravine, believing both were dead. But one survived. 
the caretaker went to prison for life. I think any time that there's an incident like this, there is a community reaction against the place where it happened. It's almost as if the place becomes cursed itself. It becomes a place of darkness. Night, pale light shine from the chateau windows. You know, you couldn't look at it without realizing a tragedy had happened here. And yes, there were many people in the town of Hillsborough that wanted to see it gone. Cut to footage of collapsed bridges, crushed cars, and devastated buildings. Emergency response workers and news crews move amid the chaos. Flames consume a city block. October 17, 1989, the Loma Prieta earthquake. This house suffered terribly. Cracks that were six to eight inches. The emergency services officer inspected the house, and he announced at that time that it was irreparably damaged, that it would have to be destroyed. Dust cakes the chandelier and empty shelves inside the library. The seeming severity of the earthquake damage was not structural, just frightening. Razor wire encloses Carolans. But for 70 years, Carolans had endured a run of bad luck. Until a local charity organization suggested one last social event. Hi, I'm Cecilia Damia, and this year I'm chairman of the show house. This is our 31st show house, but this year we're doing the biggest, and I hope the best, that has ever been done. The 1991 Decorator's Show House at the Carolands was a benefit for the nearby Coyote Point Museum for Environmental Education. For six weeks, people lined up and paid $20 apiece to see the inside of the chateau and all the renovation that a coat of paint and furniture could provide. What we do is we bring in designers to actually decorate the rooms, and then we invite the public to come in to tour the house, and this is how we raise the money. Decorator show house organizers. We had to make it beautiful. This house had been through so much for so many years until the show house, and it turned the whole atmosphere around. They came from all over. We had busloads of people. And we had the governor's wife. Special tour for Joe and Jennifer Montana. Just incredible. Always people. On. We were able to raise about a million dollars. 68,000 people who came through. Guests dine at tables covered with white tablecloths. And of those 68,000 people, one of them was Ann Johnson, wife of Charles Johnson, a successful entrepreneur in financial markets. Anne remembers the first time she saw the chateau. I happened to have my decorator, Mario Boada, out helping me on my house here in Hillsborough. And I said, I heard that there was a very interesting decorator show house. We walked into the library. And I said, this is one of the most beautiful rooms I've ever seen. The elegant chandelier illuminates oak-paneled shelving as sunlight pours in through a floor-to-ceiling window. And I don't know who the architect was, but this is really some room. A fireplace with a mirror hung above its mantel is set in the middle of the shelving. To the left, two pillars support a ceiling beam. Now Anne and Charles stroll through the library with their two small dogs. In 1998, seven years later, for only $6 million, the Johnsons were the new owners of Chateau Carolans. I was very excited about being able to fix it because I always, I felt it was like a beautiful lady who had never had a decent dress to wear. <laughs> Wispy clouds roll over the chateau. But where Ann Johnson saw potential, Many others saw nearly 100 years of neglect. Contractor Doug Wilson. My first feeling was that the house was absolutely dead. And, and a lot of people thought the house was haunted. I had just the exact opposite feeling. It was devoid of any, anything. There was nothing alive in this house. A photo of a desolate hall. Completely cold. 
destroyed from water and air infiltration, mold. It was just bad. Rotting carpet covers the grand stairway. Initially, it was overwhelming. When we first started the project, I wasn't sure I could pull it off, honestly. I felt this house needs to be torn down. Cracks streaked the exterior. The restoration started here to stabilize this whole entire roofing system. Scaffolding rises against the south facade. Workers in hard hats and dust masks repair the roof, tearing down deteriorated tiles. The roof took a little over a year. Roughly $3 million to do in its entirety as you see it now. Light bathes the chateau's north facade in a warm glow as the sun rises. I felt I was very fortunate to be in a position to restore it. Because when you're lucky enough to have things go well for you, it's nice to be able to turn something back. The pool reflects the west facade's prominent dome in its undulating water. Curtis Coleman, Master Craftsman, Antique Restorations. Stewardship. It's a responsibility that's acquired by someone buying a residence of this type. Curtis Coleman was hired for the most delicate and difficult task, restoration of the library. When we arrived, the room hadn't been, I think it was 40 years, hadn't been touched. Major sections of the cornice were missing. The panels were split. The columns had splits in them, dirty. Rainwater had come in. And it just looked like it had been abandoned. I have about 20 employees. And I'll walk the whole crew and explain to them exactly what I want to accomplish. Very often, I'll back it up with books, give them a history lesson. So-and-so lived here. Feel it. Think about it. And then as you work on the room, apply those thoughts to it. A glowing lamp set atop an end table illuminates the oak paneling at the foot of a winding staircase. You're doing the highest quality woodwork that there is. And you've participated in saving history. Woodwork doesn't get any better. A view sweeps across the restored two-level library. And historians and architects that know true buildings, they're impressed. And I don't mind that. I don't mind it at all because I'm impressed that I did it as well. Interior decorator Mario Buada. I think what's unique about it is that we're sitting in this house that has been restored to the way it was in 1917 when it was first completed. And you feel like you're sitting back in history, and yet you're here today. In the Bordeaux Salon. So this has the most beautiful floor. This floor is just unbelievable. So we don't want to put a rug on it. No it's rug. nice no. to show. In fact, well, we've been working on it for almost five years. And this, of course, is Vanya Metal. This has to be raised. We have to raise the painting. You need something here in the center. But aren't they nice in here, these? These are really nice. I think you need a bright touch of yellow there. It feels wonderful. It does. It feels healthy. It feels like you're in a greenhouse. We are. This mantle looks very bare, too. To order three more. 40 or more rooms to do this afternoon. See, we can never have any fun. It's always work, work, work. Uh-oh. My dog has been chewing the base of this table. Big problem. Nothing is easy. This was putting these little rosettes. See, that will go on the corner like that. And then in your spare time, you can sew these on. Oh. I think that most of the things that people don't think about in decorating is to have a sense of humor about it. And no whining, Mrs. Johnson. <laughs> oh, no, let her whine. Then she can hear herself whining. She'll say, that me? Do I sound like that? <laughs> That'll be funny. This is coming. <laughs> you keep saying that every time. Cut the wine, please. Cut the wine. Cut the wine. Yeah, I can get to do a lot of things now because she's on camera. <laughs> and measures a wall. 88. OK, thanks. Eight and a half? Should be twisted around this um, leg. 
Well, I think they're all set here. I think all you need now are the guests to fill the room up. There's nothing well. else I could say about this ball, <laughs> except that we hope to have a lot of good parties here and a lot of fundraisers for good causes. Interfaith Hospitality Network, benefit for homeless families. I'm Jenny Bolt, and I'd like to welcome you all on behalf of Charlie and Ann Johnson to Carolyn's. But I have to be honest, because although we do a lot of fundraisers here, I sort of uh, struggled with the irony of uh, doing an event for homeless families in a house that perhaps some might argue is more than a family needs. But everybody needs a home. And with the funds we're going to raise here tonight, you'll realize we really can make a difference in the lives of homeless families who need it the most. At a table with a sign reading, take a rose and fund a need, patrons fill out cards and hang them on a small tree. It is true that some very wealthy people choose to leave their mark in grand houses. And I think Carol Lands is definitely in that tradition, in the tradition of leaving a house that's so magnificent that it really wants to be a museum, it really wants to belong to the public. And in fact, that's exactly what has happened. As of January 1st, 2013, Chateau Carol Lands became a foundation donated and endowed by the Johnsons with a mission to preserve, protect, and put to good use the chateau. The Carolins is now owned by Carolins Foundation, a private trust. Our intention is to continue to use the house as it's always been used and as Harriet intended to be used for the arts, for culture, and for historic study. Carolins Foundation will maintain the chateau in perpetuity. It will be a resource for historians, for students, for architects, I consider this a new beginning. Old houses take an enormous amount of care and maintenance. This house was restored to a pristine condition, really superior to how it ever was originally, and we intend to maintain that. Meg Starr, executive director of Carol Ann's Foundation. The Johnsons never planned to live here forever. They restored the property to save it. Wouldn't Harriet be delighted that her dream is fulfilled a hundred years later, but she has been successful. Wrought iron gates part and the view drifts toward the chateau down a brick drive lined with manicured hedges and trees. Repaired, restored, redecorated. What began as one woman's fantasy of a home so grand ends up as testimony to our innate love of beauty, our love of place, our love of home. From the entry, a view twirls as the skylight sets the columns aglow. And so, after nearly 100 years, Chateau Carolans lives on. Outside, the pool reflects Chateau Carolans' west facade. A rock drops into the pool, sending ripples across the reflection. Credits, Aluna Productions presentation, produced and directed by Katherine Ryan and Gary Weinberg, written and edited by Gary Weinberg, director of photography, Tim Metzger, music by Todd Bokelhide, narrator, Lori Holt. Funding for video description provided by the U.S. Department of Education. Video description by CaptionMax. DVDs and coffee table book available at lunaproductions.com. Copyright 2014, Luna Productions. This program made possible by Stephen Silver Fine Jewelry, a global jewelry company based in the heart of Silicon Valley, strategically advising families and individuals in the procurement and sale of precious gemstones, estate, and fine jewelry for over four decades. And by Fiduciary Trust Company International. For more than 80 years, helping families grow and preserve their assets for generations to come. And Wells Fargo Bank. Together, we'll go far. And ISU Insurance Services, the one responsible source for all your insurance needs. Our knowledge is your best insurance.
from the golden age of opulence stands Britain's most famous country home. Despite an ancient curse, these houses give up secrets in strange places. And the threat of war and ruin. You don't want to be the Earl that lets the whole thing down. It became the real life star of Downton Abbey. It never fluffs its lines, does it? And it always looks great. The Secrets of High Clear Castle. Tonight at 8 on KQED. Masterpiece mystery. Sherlock! Sherlock is back. It's been two years. He's got on with his life. What life? I've been away. The one person he thought didn't matter was the one person that mattered the most. I don't care how you faked it. I want to know why. This one's got us all baffled. The terror alert has been raised. An attack is coming. You have missed this. Sherlock on Masterpiece mystery. The game is on. And the wait is over. Tonight at 10. Highclere Castle, world famous as the location for hit drama series Downton Abbey. Over centuries, it's played host to royalty, nobility, and celebrity. It holds unexpected secrets. This is a fairy tale castle with a real life lord and lady and even a real-life butler. I think it's very important to maintain standards because once they disappear, they will never come back. This is the behind-the-scenes story of England's best-known country home. Explore new worlds and new ideas through programs like this. Made available for everyone through contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. 70 miles west of London lies one of the great estates of England, Highclere, a country house nestling in forest.